welcome to our uh, revision towards 2021 Ghana School of Law and Chance Examination. Now, tonight, I would like to do a focused discussion on remedies for breach of contracts. And this is going to be a very uh, quick revision because all of us are supposed to have uh, done uh, the reading around it. So what I am doing is just uh, mopping up. And then uh, when I am done, uh, we will endeavor to uh, look at uh, some uh, questions. So by uh, remedies for breach of contracts, we have to remember that we have common law remedies for breach of contract and equitable remedies for breach of contracts. The common law remedy for breach of contract is damages. And the equitable remedies for breach of contract are specific performance and injunction. Let me emphasize that rescission and rectification are equitable remedies for right. But in terms of uh, remedies for breach of contract, technically, they are not considered as remedies for breach of contract. Yeah, so let's take note of that. Rescission is where you, are, you set the contract aside, uh, which was voidable, and yeah. So that presupposition is that the contract has not necessarily been uh, breach, but that there is uh, something lacking as far as genuineness of consent, as well as validity of the contract is concerned. That is why you are setting it aside. So that one is the remedy of rescission. And then we also have the remedy of rectification. Remedy of rectification is where you are trying to correct a document which does not fairly reflect the intentions of the parties. So where you do that is not really about breach of contract. And that is why rectification is not treated as an equitable remedy for breach of contract. I'm not saying it's not an equitable remedy, it's an equitable remedy. But if you are talking about uh, remedies for uh, breach of contract, is not uh, necessarily uh, one of them. And that is uh, what we should keep in mind. So having said that, we will proceed to start our discussion of uh, remedies for uh, breach of contract as I have uh, indicated to you uh, not long ago. So let me share this uh, with you. Yeah, so first, uh, we have to remember that before we can even have like the, a breach of contract, we have to remember it is a, a term of major importance of the contract, which might have been broken. And that is why we call it the, a breach. So a term of major importance is a condition, as we know, and condition go to the very foundation of the contract. So when it is breached or broken, uh, the innocent party is entitled to repudiate the contract, to treat the contract as having come to an end, and to be able to bring an action to recover uh, damages for breach of contract. So let us uh, keep that in mind. And on the other hand, a breach of a warranty, which is a term of a lesser importance, does not actually result in a, uh, a, a, a breach which will entitle you to recover damages for breach of contract. So let's keep that in mind. Sorry, which will entitle you to repudiate the contracts. You can recover damages for the breach, but the contract will still continue. It will not bring the contract to an end. It will not discharge the contract. So let's keep that uh, in mind. And of course, we also remember the term that we call innominate or intermediate term, the Hong Kong fair case, right? Hong Kong fair against 
Kawaza Kashan case, where you know, Diplock said that there are certain terms of contract which you can neither classify as warranty or condition. And you have to adopt what you call the wait and see approach. Let a breach occur. And when a breach has occurred, you assess the impact of the breach on the rest of the contract. If the impact of the breach is quite uh, uh, severe, in the sense that it really uh, empties the contract of its entire purpose and all that, then you give the innocent party remedies, which are given for a uh, breach of contract uh, as it were. So these are some of the things that we have to uh, keep uh, in mind in talking about a breach, which will entitle a plaintiff or innocent party to recovery of damages. So as we have said, uh, damages, uh, basically refers to uh, monetary compensation, right? For breach of contracts. And we have uh, fundamental uh, breach and non-fundamental breach. So fundamental breach, uh, a breach uh, which is uh, so crucial that a, a major term is broken and then the entire contract will be considered as having really come to an end. And so on the repudiatory breach. And then we also have a breach which is non-fundamental or non-repudiatory in the sense that it relates to a breach of a warranty. And then we also have anticipatory breach. Anticipatory breach is where the time for performance of the obligation has not yet arrived. And yet the person who is supposed to perform invents an intention that he or she will not perform. So that is an anticipatory uh, breach. So what is the purpose of awarding damages in contract? The purpose of awarding damages in contract is quite straightforward and will not belabor the point. The purpose of awarding damages is simply to put the innocent party in a position that he or she will have been if the contract had not been breached or if the contract had not been broken. So therefore, we say that in awarding damages in contract, we are not seeking to punish the contract breaker. So damages are not meant to be punitive as, as well as far as law of contract is concerned. Of course, in law of thought, uh, damages could in some circumstances be punitive, but as far as law of contract is concerned, it is not punitive at all. It is purely compensatory, meaning that trying to put the innocent party in the position that he or she would have been and the contract not been broken. And that is the point uh, made in the case of Robinson against Harmon. And uh, we also have to uh, remember that uh, Addis Gamuf, uh, Addis and Gamuf Company Limited, as well as the Ghanaian case of Mullah and Home Finance Company Limited, all reinforce the point that you don't award uh, damages to as a way of punishment. That will defeat the purpose of awarding damages in contract. And again, talking about damages, we have to remember uh, uh, two key things. The idea of liquidated damages and unliquidated damages. Unliquidated damages refers to a contractual situation in which the parties have made a contract, a breach has occurred, and yet the, the parties did not make provision in the contract regarding how much compensation should be paid in the event of a breach. So that when a breach occurs, the courts will have to assist the parties to work out the appropriate level of compensation or the damages to be paid. So where the courts will have to assess damages for the parties, we call that un unliquidated damages. On the other hand, where at the time of making the contract, the parties have made provision in the contract regarding the compensation which should be uh, paid in the event of a breach to the other party. If it is a genuine attempt, and the emphasis is if it is a genuine attempt to estimate the loss, which may be occasion in the event of a breach, then as uh, Lord Danidin said, in the case of a uh, Dunlop pneumatic tire limited against new garage and motor limited, that will be very much recoverable because that is consistent with the aim of awarding damages. On the other hand, where you have uh, made the contracts and you put a certain figure as a man to be paid and the amount appears to be exorbitant, excessive, 
having no regard to even like the maximum loss, which will be sustained in the event of a breach, or where the amount to be paid is like the same amount for all manner of breaches so that it is arbitrary, then it will not reflect a genuine attempt to pre-estimate the loss which may be occasioned in the event of a breach. And for that matter, it will be treated as a penalty clause. And according to Dunlop Matica Limited against the Garage and Motor Limited, a penalty clause is not enforceable because it defeats the purpose of awarding uh, damages uh, in contract. So let's uh, keep that uh, in mind. And that when it comes to, uh, so most of the attention will be focused on unliquidated damages because that is where uh, the, 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 the rare work is in the sense that the parties have not made a uh, provision regarding how much compensation should be paid in the event of a breach. And for that matter, uh, the courts will have to help the parties to uh, make a determination regarding what loss can be compensated, what loss cannot be compensated. If a loss can be compensated, how much money should be paid and so on and so forth. So the court will do this by addressing uh, two things, uh, the concept of remoteness of damages and also measure of damages. So by remoteness of damages, we simply means that uh, and which heads of damage that is, uh, which uh, type of loss can be brought into claim for damages? What type of loss? Is it the loss of profit, loss of opportunity, loss of what? What type of loss can be uh, claimed for by way of damages or compensation? And so it determines uh, what they call the question of entitlement. What are you entitled to recover damages for? So that is remoteness, right? And we also have the related uh, concept, measure of damages, assessment of damages. How do you uh, translate the damages which you have uh, determined as the damages to be recoverable into monetary terms, right? So that is uh, another uh, thing. And that one is done under the rubric we call measure of damages or assessment of damages. So therefore, we could simply say that the test of remoteness determines entitlements. In other words, whether the plaintiff, the innocent party, is really entitled to recover compensation for uh, certain losses due to the breach of the contract. And the and not the quantum or not how much uh, money or how much compensation, right? But measure of damages or assessment of damages, as we've said, uh, determines quantification of the losses in terms of money or how the losses are evaluated in money terms. So the question is, how uh, do the courts go about? in resolving the issue of remoteness of damages. In other words, in making a determination as to whether certain losses can be recovered as a result of like the breach of the contract. Now, we should remember very well that the well-known uh, case of what we call like the Hadley Ambassador, right? It's a very uh, old case and all of us are students of uh, uh, law of contract in the common law world, we are supposed to know it. Uh, hardly embarrassing them, uh, where uh, Baron Addison propounded, if you like, uh, what they call like the one principle with two legs, or the two related principle in one group, that where two parties have made a contract, which one of them has broken, the damages which the other party ought to receive in respect of such breach of contract should be such as may be fairly and reasonably considered either arising naturally according to the usual course of things from breach of contract or such as may reasonably be supposed to have been in contemplation of both parties at the time they made the contract as a probable result of a breach of it. In other words, 
uh, he was making the point that when a breach of contract uh, has occurred, we can simply see that uh, there are two main categories of damages, what they call the general damages and then the special damages. The general damages refers to those losses which are considered as arising uh, naturally, right, in the usual uh, course of things uh, from the breach of the contracts. And the special damages are those losses which are considered as being reasonably, right? Uh, reasonably supposed to have been in contemplation, that is in the anticipation of the parties at the time they made the contract and not when the breach occurs, we pay attention. At the time they made the contract as a probable result of a breach of it. And that is what we call like the special damages. So by the special damages, the type of losses which do not necessarily flow uh, naturally on the ordinary course of things from the breach of the contract. However, if at the time of making the contract, certain information had been shared, right, by the parties, so that the other party is very much aware that in the event of a breach, this type of loss was also going to be suffered, then it can be recoverable. And that is why we say that us may reasonably be supposed to have been the contemplation of both parties. So it's very much dependent upon what information was made known to the other party. The actual information made known to the other party will determine whether he ought to have anticipated that in the event of a breach, he was the other party, the innocent party was going to suffer some special losses, right? For which reason compensation should be provided. And that type of compensation is what we call like the special damages. As I said, uh, I'm running uh, very fast and uh, a bit different from how we usually do it in a normal classroom because you have a very limited time. And the idea is to give you a quick brush up of things so that you're able to uh, move on. And I think that uh, law of contracts, uh, law of thoughts, uh, these are very constitutional law, legal system, very important, isn't it? Land law, these are the examinable areas and criminal law. So we need to know all the topics. I don't, I'm not interested in you uh, targeting any particular question, but know all the topics. If you understand everything, you are very ready to go and write the examination and I'm confident that will pass, right? Good. So what happened in Hadley and Bazin there? Remember that there was a, a mill which had the, the, I think the shaft broken and uh, the engineers who were supposed to make a replacement for them needed uh, the broken shaft so that they could uh, look at it as a pattern to be able to mold the new one replacement. Now the owners of the mail gave the, 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 the shafts to carriers and the carrier delayed in giving it to the engineers at where uh, they were, somewhere in the, uh, the Greenwich, and this were in the Gloucester. So as a result of the delay in giving the broken shaft to the engineers, it also affected their ability to be able to mold the new uh, path uh, so that it could be given to the carrier for it to be returned to the male owners for them to put it back and resume operation. Now, the first indicate that the mail was actually uh, closed down due to the broken uh, shaft. Uh, however, when they gave the broken part to the carrier, they did not make it known to them that they had stopped operation and they were waiting for the replacement. And for that matter, when there was a, a, a delay in giving it to them and all that, that was obviously a breach. Now question which arose was this, whether the owners of the mill could recover compensation, could recover damages for losses which arise naturally from the breach of the contract or whether they could recover damages or compensation for 
for losses which also arise from special circumstances of the case. Special circumstances in the, sen in the sense that special knowledge, special information have been made available to the parties at the time that the contract was made. And for that matter, it was within their contemplation that in the event of a breach, such type of loss was going to be suffered. So those were the, the claims which were before uh, the court. And uh, the, the courts uh, using the test that we have uh, stated made the point that we need to ask, did the laws arise naturally? In other words, will it have been clear to any reasonable person that such loss was likely to result from the breach? If the answer is yes, then damages are payable for that kind of loss. And so in subsequent cases, uh, this type of losses are called the direct losses or direct damages or general damages, right? On the other hand, alternatively, if some or all of the damages were not direct or natural, right? But of a more abnormal kind, question is, the defendant know about it at the time the contract was made and pay attention, the knowledge of that special uh, type of loss as uh, being reasonably uh, within the contemplation of the parties, it work according to what was known by the parties at the time the contract was made and not what was known after the contract has been made and before the breach. So pay attention to that, especially for purposes of your multiple choice uh, question. Now, if the answer is that, at the time that the contract was made, the other party knew very much of this special information. Then it was reasonably supposed to have been in his contemplation that in the event of a breach, he was going to suffer a breach. I mean, he was going to suffer, the, the innocent party was going to suffer uh, a loss of that kind, for which reason it should be recoverable. Yeah, so as I said that uh, we have a very limited time, so we will skip some of the other things which are usually uh, discussed in a typical classroom fashion. But one thing uh, I would like to draw your attention to, if nothing at all, uh, as far as the principle in Hadley uh, Brand, sorry, uh, not Hadley Brand again, Helen Patton, the principle in a hardly ambassador, right? Hardly ambassador uh, is that we have to remember the clarification which was given to that principle by Lord Justice Asquith subsequently in the case of Vitura Landry against uh, Newman. And in that case, uh, you know, it was about like the, 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 the laundry, right? They had a boiler, the boiler was uh, more functioned. They needed like a new one, and the new one that they requested, the engineers were supposed to do the uh, removal and installation, made the mistake, so there was a damage. So they had to repeat the whole process, and that affected the time for getting the, the new boiler installed and all that. And the laundry lost certain special uh, lucrative uh, you know, dying uh, contracts and so on. So the question was, whether they could recover uh, damages or compensation for all those type of losses. So it was in the context of that, that Lord Justice Asquith made the point that when you make a contract and there's a breach, in terms of damages, which are said to be recoverable, it depends uh, very much upon uh, the type of knowledge which the parties had. And Lord Justice Asquith in Vitura Landry against Human said that uh, knowledge is of two kinds, imputed knowledge and actual knowledge. And by imputed uh, knowledge, uh, he was making the point that every uh, uh, no, human being, reasonable human being, certain things, are taken for granted based upon the circumstances you find yourself that 
uh, you know, or you ought to have known that if this thing happened, then that is likely to happen. So if a breach occurred, then these type of losses are likely to be suffered and so on and so forth. So that is imputed knowledge. And then we also have uh, actual knowledge. Actual knowledge is never assumed, it's never presumed, right? It is something which you actually know because you have been made aware. At the time the contract was made, or you do not know because you are not made aware at the time the contract was made. And well, the imputed knowledge, we can link that to what we call the special, sorry, the general damages or the direct losses or direct damages. So uh, yes, and then the actual knowledge, we can link that to the special damages, right? Or the abnormal losses uh, as it were. Now, uh, that's, I think, for purposes of our revision, that is enough for remoteness of damages uh, in law of contract. What about measure of damages or quantification of damages? Now, when it comes to having uh, determined the range of losses, right? For which reason uh, a party not in, this, not in breach can be allowed to recover compensation. That is what we call like the remoteness. So those damages, which are considered as not being too remote, right, from the breach of the contract, either because they arise naturally, that is directly from the breach, due to what we call like the imputed knowledge, uh, which Lord does is as you've told us in material and dragons, or uh, because uh, those damages uh, are said to have been within the reasonable contemplation of the parties due to actual knowledge or actual information which have been made known at the time the contract was made. Good. Now, having resolved that, how do we translate those losses which we have actually determined as being recoverable into money? So that one, as I said, is taken care of by the measure or quantification of what of uh, damages uh, as it were. So here, we begin to assess a claim for damages and to arrive at actual sums of money. So we look at things like uh, new for old or old for old, uh, which arises when we consider claims for, let's say, cost of replacing lost or destroyed or damaged property. And then we also look further at the mathematical adjustment which will have to be made to take account of certain economic factors that may be relevant to the claim. And that is why in the case of Hayes and Dots, Lord Justice Patras made the point that, quote, the measure of damages is that figure which so far as is practicable in the circumstances achieves the maximum Restitution in integrum. So the maximum restitution in integrum. Good. So what it simply means is that when the court are translating the damages into money, they will try to restore the innocent party's loss in full rather than just simply in parts. Because, and this is consistent with also the, 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 the purpose or the goal of awarding damages to put the innocent party in the position that he or she would have been in had the contract not been breached or had the contract be performed as made. Therefore, uh, certain principles or rules of thumb guide the court. And one is that the court will be seeking to uh, achieve expectation interest, right? So there's what they call like the expectation uh, damages. And what uh, this means uh, simply is that you try to find out what is the value of the thing for which the innocent party had bargained. The, what is the value of what was contracted for, right? And what is the value of 
the thing now, that which was not received. So sometimes it may simply come to trying to uh, find out the, the market, like the contract price, right? Minus the, 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 the minus the, the market price or the market price less the contract price. And that will be, if you like, the, the quantum, which, because that is the actual loss, which the innocent party has what has suffered uh, as it were. And if you look at the sale of goods act of Ghana, for example, uh, is consistent with that. On the other hand, sometimes it is not possible to be able to ascertain clearly how much loss a party not in default might have suffered as a result of the breach of the contract. So where that is the case, and there's something you call the reliance damage, right? So reliance damage simply means that the court is not in the position to be able to award amount of compensation which will put the innocent party in the position that he would have been if the contract had been performed as made. Where it is not practically possible to work that out, the court could look at providing damages or compensation to take care of the expenses you have had to incur as a result of your reliance on the contract. As happened in the case of the Angler uh, uh, television against read where the court, I mean, there, there was the, the company, uh, Angler Television, uh, they were going to do a series, right? And to make a film, spent uh, hoping some of 2,750, they employed a director and designer. Then they contracted with uh, one read to play uh, the leading man role in the in, in the firm. Now this person uh, had a change of mind and decided to uh, repudiate the contract to say that well I will not perform. Should even the time for making it arrive, so some sort of uh, anticipatory uh, breach sort of. So he repudiated it, and the company, that is a television company, could not find replacement, could not find somebody to play the role which you're supposed to have paid. So they had no choice but to abandon the firm. So when the company sued, uh, the company was able to recover uh, the amount of money which they had actually uh, spent as a wasted expenditure. Because uh, as it were, since it was a firm and it was yet to be made, and the company was not in a position to be able to determine how much revenue will have actually uh, been received or how much profit will have been made had the firm be successfully been completed because you could not predict how uh, you know, consumers would actually receive such a firm and so on. And for that matter, the call said that uh, it was not uh, possible to work out uh, what they have gained had the contract been uh, performed. Had the guy not repudiated uh, the role he was going to play. For that reason, the court said that uh, they should recover that which they have actually spent as a result of what the contract. So that is what we call like, the reliance, if you like, uh, damage or the reliance interest. And that is what is gone uh, for, gone in for where it is not possible to achieve the expectation damage or expectation interest as it were. Okay, so maybe just uh, one or two things I want to touch on with respect to uh, damages because of our limited time, as I told you, this is a very uh, crash revision. Yeah, so we also have what we call like the non-pecuniary losses. That is non-financial losses. Uh, well, generally, 
damages for breach of contract relate to financial loss, including loss of expected financial gains, but not really uh, pecuniary losses. Uh, but in recent times, the courts have shown willingness to allow recovery of non-pecuniary, non-financial losses in the event of a breach of contract, if the test of remoteness can be satisfied. And if I say the test of remoteness, you have to remember what I'm talking about. Uh, we, I'm talking about uh, what we encountered in Hadley and Basin, the Bitola Roundry. Did the loss arise naturally and directly from the breach of the contract? That is uh, what Lord Asif will say in the Victoria Landry that the imputed knowledge. Or uh, can we say that the loss was reasonably within contemplation of the parties or uh, in terms of the actual knowledge of what, uh, what actual knowledge they had at the time that the contract was made? Good. So if that can be uh, met, then you can actually recover and non pecuniary losses for things like loss of amenity, right? Uh, disappointment and injured feelings. Uh, so I mean, a good case to illustrate is a case of a rosary electronics and faucet. And rosary electronics and faucet is a, is a very important case because uh, where uh, the House of Laws uh, recognized that damages may be awarded for loss of amenity, uh, where the purpose of the contract was to give uh, the plaintiff a subjective, even if it was syncretic a pleasure or amenity. In other words, so let's just look at the resident electronics. The contract was for making of a swimming pool, right? The uh, Plaintiff, Mr. Fawcett, gave his desired specification of what type of swimming pool that he wanted. The makers of the swimming pool, uh, Resil Electronics and the Construction Limited, they made the swimming pool, except that there was some minor shortfall in terms of the contractual specification of the dimension and the depth, right? And what they actually did. Now, when Mr. Fawcett examined it, he said that, no, they have not carried out the contract. They have breached the contract. So he was suing to recover the full cost of making a swimming pool, destroying whatever they have done and then redoing it and so on and so forth. Then the matter traveled right all the way to the house of law. And then the court said that, uh, the court said that when there is a, a breach of contract, when there's a breach of contract, hello, father, my child, my child there online, we are my friend, right? And that's it. So, so that when there's a, a breach of, uh, sorry, I had that. When there's a, a breach of, uh, 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 contracts, the courts will have to uh, award uh, damages for expectation uh, interest, as we have explained, to uh, put um, an enough compensation to put the innocent party in the position that he or she would have been had the contract not been uh, breached uh, as it were. But in this particular case, the court took the view that the swimming pool which had been made was perfectly fit for all manner of swimming and diving and all that. And for that matter, it was not uh, reasonable to say that it should be destroyed and then it's reconstructed and all that. But the court recognized that once a person had contracted for a swimming pool of a certain dimension, right? The person, wanted to have a certain excitement, a certain enjoyment, a certain appeal, which is intrinsic to him that I have a swimming pool of this particular dimension. And that is what the court said that there is the amenity. So that was the, the loss of amenity by not getting uh, the, the swimming pool of his dimension. And for that reason, uh, the, 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 
the innocent party, that is the plaintiff, was entitled to compensation, was entitled to damages. And that damages is for loss of amenity, right? Well, uh, there's also been uh, this argument as to whether you can, I mean, still get the you know, non-financial uh, or non-pecunial damages. And uh, a very useful case, because we are uh, lawyers and law students, is the case of Davis and Swantos. The plaintiff had made a holiday booking for the defendants on basis of what they have read in the brochure advertising the holiday package. Now, when he got to the holiday destination, the experience he had was that what was at the holiday destination, the resort, was something significantly different from what he had read in the brochure. So to him, that was just like a breach of contract. Now, when uh, he sued, the court said that he was entitled to recover damages for disappointment, right? So disappointment in the sense that what he read in the brochure as what the holiday package was, was very much different from what he encountered at the holiday destination. So Javis against Swantos also reinforces the point that you can even recover damages for uh, non pecuniary loss in the context of a breach of what? Uh, contract. So let's keep uh, that in mind. Yes, it's also possible to recover damages for uh, loss caused to third uh, uh, parties, right? Because uh, Daxon against uh, Horizon, uh, Horizon Holidays Limited, for example, the plaintiff made the booking of holiday for himself, for his wife and two children. And the, what the brochure advertised was different from what they actually experienced, just like uh, uh, Jarvis and Swanto. And the court said that uh, he was entitled to recover damages not only for himself and also for his, for third party, that is his wife and children, who had all experienced uh, uh, disappointment, right? And maybe one thing we should remember is what we call the uh, concept of uh, uh, nominal damages, right? When we say nominal damages, is also awarded for breach of contract. And nominal damages, uh, as the name suggests, nominal name token, is a damages which is awarded whenever there is a breach of contract, but no loss has been occasioned. There's no discernible loss, no measurable loss, which have been occasioned as a result of the breach of the contract. So. In that context, you can get what you call nominal uh, damages. Maybe just before uh, uh, we go, although we are not doing uh, sale of goods or commercial law as part of your exams, but it's important to remember that uh, the Sale of Goods Act uh, 1962 at 137 has got a very useful provision concerning how we compute uh, damages for breach of a sale of goods contract. And mutatis mutandis also for uh, computing uh, damages in breach of contract like in general. So as I said, we usually subtract the contract price from the market price. And then the difference will give you like the measure or the quantum of damages so that Let's look at this example. If goods were sold for 1,000 Ghana cities, right? And if at the time of the seller's failure to supply the buyer, the buyer had to pay 1,200 to get a similar goods. So the buyer will be awarded 200 uh, as damages. The reason uh, being that if the contract had been performed, the buyer will have gotten the goods at the price that he bargained for. That is thousand, but now he has to get the same goods at extra cost. So if you are going to pay him compensation, you have to pay him uh, the difference. So the contract price is thousand, and the market price is thousand two hundred. So if you adjust the two, the market price less the contract price, 
you get a difference of what, 200. Yeah, so, but if, let's say that the price has actually gone down, right? So that the market price has gone down, so that the market price now is even lower than the original contract price. What it means is that the innocent party has not actually suffered any loss because the same thing that uh, you bargain for, let's say a thousand, you cannot get it at uh, 800 uh, Ghana cities. You even have like a saving of what, 200. Nevertheless, since the vendor or the seller failed to deliver, there is still breach of contract. And because there's a breach of contract and you have not actually experienced any loss, right? you will still be entitled to damages, but the damages that you get is what we call the nominal damages, which is token damages, right? Nominal or token damages. So let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. Now, we cannot also conclude discussion on damages without touching on the concept of uh, mitigation of damages or mitigation of loss. And it's simply to the effect that first and foremost, if you are plaintiff, you are claiming damages, you only obtain damages, excuse me, you only obtain damages caused by the breach of the contract, which the parties reasonably had in contemplation. In other words, when a breach of contract okay, yes, we understand that losses will follow. But the court expect that if there is something reasonable you could do, right, as innocent party, to minimize escalation of the losses flowing from the breach of the contract, then you ought to do that. Because if, especially so, if you could do something uh, at no significant inconvenience or cost to you, and that would have uh, minimized, right? That will have minimized the losses. That will have actually prevented the losses from escalating, from becoming uh, worse, right? Then, if you do not uh, do that, uh, the court will actually say that the damages uh, due to you should be less uh, what it would have been if you could have uh, taken those measures which were not unreasonable, which were not uh, excessively burdensome for you to uh, uh, mitigate it, right? But yeah, so. Uh, we can simply say that the mitigation of damages requires that uh, you are supposed to put up a reasonable conduct, right? After a breach of contract has occurred. And what is the purpose of this reasonable conduct? To prevent the losses from becoming different in kind or higher in amount than is necessary. But as I said, it doesn't mean that you should do uh, something which is uh, really burdensome, right? Or which is excessively uh, expensive or unreasonable. Okay, so having uh, noted the principle of mitigation of damages, we quickly run to uh, equitable remedies for breach of contract. As I said, there are two. I'm not saying that there are only two equitable remedies, but in relation to breach of contract, the equitable remedies are specific performance and then injunction. Specific performance is an equitable remedy by which a decree or an order is made by the court compelling the party in breach to perform his contractual obligation. So you're ordered by the court to carry out exactly what you agreed to do. So that is specific performance. But we have to note that specific performance being an equitable remedy 
is subject to the maxims or principles which govern uh, equity, right? So all the things that we know about equity are applicable, mutatis, mutandis. But there are also some specific restrictions on availability of specific performance. In other words, there are some instances in which the court may refuse to grant specific performance. What are some of them? First, the court specific performance will not be granted where damages will be an adequate remedy. In other words, when a breach has occurred and monetary compensation can be paid to remedy it, there's no way that the court will grant specific performance. And we see that from the cases of Red Coal Limited against uh, Sapon and so on. And uh, the most typical instance in which the court will say that damages will not be adequate remedy. For example, uh, when it comes to contract for, let's say, sale of what, uh, sale of land, because we are told that no two parcels of land are the same due to location and due to what can be done with that land and so on. So if someone has contracted to buy land at let's say Hacho, and you fail to deliver the land. You could not say that if you got money, you can also go to a bridge to buy the land, right? Or to buy land at a, a Joso, and you say that, well, if you got money, you could go to uh, at the end term to buy the land. No, no two parcels of land are the same. So uh, the court, is more likely to be disposed to grant specific performance since damages will not be adequate remedy. And that is why if we look at let's say like the sale of this act of Ghana, for example, uh, when it comes to sale of specific goods, right? When it comes to sale of specific goods, uh, you are more likely to get a specific performance in the event of a breach because specific goods are goods which have been identified before the contract was made. Or to speak generally, you could say that where the goods contracted for are rare, uh, that is unique. They are not ordinarily available on the market. Even if you had all the money, you are not likely to get them. Then uh, it is reasonably scarce commodity. And for that matter, the court may be disposed to grant specific performance, right? And again, the principle of mutuality, specific performance is available only if it will be available to the other party. So for example, if there's a contract between a minor and uh, an adult, the court will never grant specific performance to a minor because uh, an adult cannot get specific performance against a minor because the requirement of mutuality cannot be or cannot be satisfied. Again, specific performance will not be granted if it will require constant supervision by the court, right? And the court make that point quite forcefully in cooperative insurance society against agile stores, that where the grant of specific performance will require constant supervision of the court for it to be effective, then the court will not grant that. Again, specific performance will not be granted in case of a contract for personal services, such as employment contracts. Employment contract. If the person is in a breach, the employer cannot go for specific performance. In the same vein, uh, the employee may not be able to get specific performance against the employer because the contract for personal service. Then also, we have to remember that specific performance will not be granted where it is not equitable to do so, or put differently. It will be granted only where it is equitable to do so. And, and that is 
consistent with the maxim that we know that he who comes to equity must come with clean hands, right? That is to say that if you are asking for specific performance for, a, for, for enforcement of a contract, and you, the person asking for it, let's say that you have impeded the other contracting party, that you want to be specifically ordered to carry out his contractual obligation. If you have impeded him from being able to perform his contractual obligation, then you, the one asking for specific performance, you have not come to equity with clean hands. And for that matter, it will not be granted. Again, specific performance will not be granted if it will cause undue hardship. And we also know that uh, delay defeats what equity. So if where there has been undue delay, specific performance will not be granted. Good. Now we come to the other equitable remedy for breach of contract. That is uh, injunction. And injunction, uh, we know that we have like the mandatory injunction by which a defendant is ordered to take positive step to put uh, right that which had been done in breach of the contracts. Certain things might have been done constituting the breach. In appropriate cases, the court could grant mandatory injunction so as to direct the defaulting party to undo that which he has done, uh, as happened in the case of the Wickham against uh, Wood. The defendant uh, in breach of his restrictive covenant directed the building so as to block plaintiff's sea view. So he was ordered to knock it down by uh, mandatory injunction because he had committed the breach deliberately with full knowledge of the plaintiff's rights. And the court was a view that damages would not have been adequate remedy in the circumstances. So he had to be ordered to reverse the wrong that he had done among him to the breach of contract. Prohibitory injunction may also be granted. And prohibitory injunction is actually granted to enforce a negative uh, uh, stipulation in the contract. Uh, that is to say that where under the contract, you are not supposed to do uh, certain things and you have done it, uh, the court could actually, uh, or, um, or you're about to do it, all right? It's not, you've not yet done it. Uh, the court could actually grant uh, prohibitory injunction to restrain you especially where the obligation is of uh, continuing character, it's an ongoing thing, right? But prohibitory injunction will be refused if the effect of it will be equivalent of granting specific performance of a contract for personal services. Because we have seen that uh, specific performance cannot be granted for personal services. So therefore, where prohibitory injunction is going to have essentially the same effect as, uh, as specific performance, then it will be uh, refused, right? So if you look at the case of the Warner Brothers uh, pictures against Nelson, those of you who watch movies, you know that Warner Brothers is a big uh, movie uh, company. Uh, the defendant contracted to work exclusively for plenty for one year as actress and uh, a US contract. Now he came to England and contracted with another company to make a film and also appeared in a theater and made personal appearances. The US uh, company was able to obtain an uh, injunction, right? To the extent of filmmaking activities. And the court refused to grant injunction which will have had like the equivalent uh, effect of specific performance. Okay, so these are the equitable uh, remedies, uh, which we have to remember. But maybe the other point to touch on briefly is what we call the remedy of restitution. Uh, that is a quasar contract, right? And uh, restitutionary remedies seek to restore money paid or value of benefit conferred on, in circumstances in which no contract exists. And you remember that in the case of the, uh, what is the case? A country and city with uh, the limited against AMB. Uh, Justice Dr. 
Datiba uh, in trying to uh, make the point that we need to advance the old approach of the common law regarding uh, know how to deal with monies or property transferred under illegal contract. He, among other things, espoused the fact that you could even apply the restitutionary work approach. That is to say that where we say that because of maybe illegality, right, or public policy, that which we thought to be contract is not really enforceable contract. But if it can be established that monies have been conferred on someone or benefit has been received, then uh, we need to let the person who received the benefit to return it to the other party. Since the benefit was received and the contract, uh, which is not really a contract as it were. Or where a contract has turned out to be void, or the parties never reach uh, the stage of proper contractual formation, and yet uh, some monies have changed hands or some benefits have been conferred and all that, then uh, restitutional remedy would allow uh, such benefits to be reversed. And the idea is to prevent unjust enrichment, right? Unjust enrichment. That is letting people so where they have no reap. People hold on to benefit, which they are not entitled to. So uh, quasar contract restitution will allow them to restore that in order to avoid unjust enrichment. And uh, a typical example of a restitutional claim uh, is what we call the quantum uh, merit. Uh, merit. Uh, a quantum merit is a claim for reasonable remuneration for services performed or things supplied, right? So that was why in the case of Hammond and Innocent, that says Aban made the point that in any case, even if I have found that there have been no concluded and enforceable agreement between the parties as to the amount of allowance the plaintiff was to receive for her services during the time the boat was under repairs, or for the other consideration supplied by her, I will still have held that the plaintiff could recover on quantum merit basis for the value of the benefit she conferred on the defendant and the defendant uh, accepted. So that is a, a quantum merit and he continued. The principle is that where a person renders service in pursuance of a transaction, supposed by him to be a contract, but which in truth is without legal validity, he can recover for the value of his services in quantum merit. And by quantum merit, we simply say that as much as your performance is worth, right? When construction contract, they will say like the pro rata. Uh, finally, we have to remember that uh, damages, uh, equitable remedies and so on are all subject to the law of limitation of actions. And remember the limitations uh, decree now called the Limitations Act, 1972 NRC Decree 54, which has prescribed timelines for bringing various types of uh, cases or causes of action in court. So when it comes to a uh, 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 simple contract, right, for example, if you look at section four of the Limitations Act, if you have a case of breach of contracts and you do not take it up and you allow six years to elapse, the case will have become statute bad. In other words, uh, the limitations law will have caught you and you'll not be able to actually do anything what, uh, about it. So let's keep that uh, in mind. In the same uh, vein, uh, where you have a case which is based on a, a quasar uh, contract, right? A quasar contract, uh, as we have explained already. And you also have to take it up within uh, six years. Otherwise, after six years, 
the ordinary traders as having become uh, started uh, bad as uh, it were. And again, uh, we, if the case is based upon, let's say, instrument under seal, so that that is a contract under seal, for example, then according to section five, right, contract under seal, we have a case for breach of contract under seal. Then according to section uh, 51A of the Limitations uh, Act, and I say decree 54, you have 12 years within which to take it up. If you don't go to court and you allow 12 years to elapse, if it's based upon a contract under seal or mortgage and so on, the case will be statute bad. So you have to uh, keep that uh, in mind. Now, in the case of uh, equitable remedies, injunctions, specific performance, if we look at Section 6 of the Limitations uh, Act, NRC uh, Decree 54, it makes uh, the point that the timelines which we have seen, the six years, 12 years, and all that applying to simple contract and contract under seal, uh, will not apply to specific performance or injunction or other equitable remedy, right? Now, what that means is that if you need specific performance or, or injunction, already equity has got its own limitation principle, such as delay defeats with equity. And what amounts to uh, delay defeating equity regarding availability of specific performance or injunction for breach of contract will be worked out by the court on case by case basis. That is why they exempted from the strict uh, timelines, uh, which we have seen. Yeah, so uh, let's uh, keep these things uh, in mind. And I think that uh, once we remember this, uh, we should uh, be fine as far as uh, any question relating to remedies for breach of contract is concerned. So thank you very much. And I am happy to receive questions or your comments uh, when you WhatsApp me uh, 057-460-4820, 057-460-4820, or you email me, uh, eodapaa at yahoo.com. And then if we need some clarifications, I'm happy to work that out with you. So thank you very much, and I wish you all the best in your exams. <laughs>